I think it's important to realize, like, if you want to use physics to circumvent these limits, that you, you have to be honest with yourself about, about what actually is it going to take in order to accomplish this, and what will you lose if you, if you do accomplish this the ways we've conceived of. And I think that, that, you know, obviously you can't fault Star Trek for getting this wrong 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Many of the things we're doing now that we're, we're physically actually doing and bringing to fruition now seem just as futuristic as warp drive or transporters or subspace communication or traveling through a stable wormhole uh, seem today. Welcome to another episode of Trolling with Logic, the podcast where we bring the hammer down on ignorance, unreason, and superstition on a bi-weekly basis. I'm your host, Nathan Dickey, and joining me as usual is Cal. Hi, it's great to be here. And Marty is back with us for one of his rare yeah. appearances. Yeah, hi. I hope I can make more appearances nowadays. Yeah, we hope so too. Joining us as our special guest on today's episode is Dr. Ethan Siegel, a theoretical astrophysicist, cosmologist, and science writer. Dr. Siegel received his PhD at the University of Florida, where his graduate work focused on the study of cosmological perturbations and their effects on the universe. He currently engages in science outreach and communication and hosts and writes the podcast and Forbes column starts with a bang. He's the author of the 2015 book Beyond the Galaxy, How Humanity Looked Beyond Our Milky Way and Discovered the Entire Universe. Ethan is also the author of a new book to be released later this year in the fall called Treknology, the Science of Star Trek from Tricorders to Warp Drive, which is the subject of this episode as we are discussing the science and technology of Star Trek and the increasingly blurry line between science fiction and science reality. Welcome to the show, Ethan Siegel. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Nathan. It's my pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all ours. There's a famous saying we've all heard, which is life imitates art. And this has been especially true in the case of early sci-fi from like the 19th century with commonplace technologies today, such as the submarine being forecasted by writers like Jules Verne, for example. Your upcoming book explores what most perceive to be the more exotic technological marvels of Star Trek and examines how close, far away, or even possible some of these as-yet fictional technologies are to us today. Tell us a little about the process of researching and writing this book. You know, for me, you, you know, when you think of Star Trek, you think of this futuristic utopia set in space where there are conflicts, but also where technology has been used to vastly improve improve our lives, where our qualities of life have, have gone up tremendously, where issues like poverty and starvation are, are really non-issues anymore, and where most medical ailments can be cured with just a few futuristic scans and hyposprays. And we sort of look at this as, oh, like, how is any of this possible? Like, this is, this is a pipe dream, except it isn't a pipe dream. All of this is rooted in scientific possibility. When Star Trek first premiered 51 years ago now, almost everything that it envisioned was was just so far seeming in the future that we didn't think we'd have any of it, that many people didn't, and that's why they sent it, they set it hundreds and hundreds of years in the future. By the time Star Trek The Next Generation came out, though, in 1987, so this is also a really long time ago, most of us don't really realize that Star Trek The Next Generation came out closer to the original Star Trek than it did to the present day. 
Star Trek The Next Generation is 30 years old. And yet, just in between those two shows, they had to thoroughly revise how they conceived of the future because those 21 years of advances were were so tremendous that many of the things that Star Trek just said, oh, like, this will be really futuristic. Imagine a door someday that, that knows when you're coming and can self-open and just slide apart. You have those every time you walk into a supermarket or an airport now. These are these are commonplace things. So, you know, flip phone communicators were were sort of, you know, just so futuristic when the original Star Trek envisioned them. And the idea that you could have an interactive computer or a touchscreen computer was incredibly futuristic in 1966. And yet by time 1987 came around, by time Star Trek The Next Generation was on the air, some of those technologies had already come to fruition. So when it came time to write and research this book to say what what about this idea is so great i said let's pick the most just the most ubiquitous technologies that people associate with Star Trek. Just the ones that pop into your mind immediately. Things like phasers and tricorders and photon torpedoes and warp drive and antimatter containment and a hypospray and and so many others like subspace communication or or the old style communicators. All of those just sprang to mind and we wound up with 28 different technologies that we said this is going to be what we're focus on, focusing on and we're going to examine each one in depth and see where are we now, what's the science behind them, are they feasible and if not what would it take to make them feasible and how close are we to having these be a reality and that's how the book came about. So just to kind of preempt it, have any of the technologies you've looked at just You've been able to completely rule out as being total pie in the sky. You know, I would say when that's a really good question. I would say the three that are closest to being ruled out are, you know, are the ones that that maybe the laws of physics just don't allow them. So, for example, subspace communication might be able to be ruled out because there's no such thing as subspace. So it's pretty hard to have subspace communication if there isn't any such thing as subspace. But that doesn't mean that you can't, through some other method, accomplish the same thing. So would it be possible to communicate faster than light across a great distance? And that may be possible if warp drive is possible. So with warp drive, like if general relativity and the standard model of particles and physics as we know it is all there is, then yes, warp drive would be impossible. But there are many extensions to the universe as we envision it that could be perfectly consistent with general relativity and enable warp drive. So for example, if you can create a form of negative mass in the universe or a form of negative energy, then all of a sudden warp drive goes from just a theoretical construct to something that is possible. So in cases like that, we've decided to look at what would it take in order for this to be true. So I'd say the three that are the, are the hardest sell because they would require something new are subspace communications, warp drive, and a transporter. A transporter, yeah. I think, is a really hard one as well. Yeah, the transporters is one that comes to mind to me to be uh, pretty ridiculous. Actually, that there there are uh, it's not just the problem of how to do it; it's also what is it exactly that that you are doing. I mean, if you break someone down into molecules, obviously that person dies, and then you create a copy. That's a really good point because I think one of the things that Star Trek was always phenomenal at is it never shied away from the big ethical questions. Right. It never shied away from saying, well, even if you could do this technologically, should you? And I think with a transporter, there is a real danger there. Imagine that you can know everything there is to know about you and your mind and your body, that you can scan in the position and momentum of every single particle in your body and how they bind together. And then what you do is you take all of that information and you deconstruct your body molecule by molecule, atom by atom, particle by particle, and you rematerialize your body someplace else. 
Okay, so maybe maybe you use identical particles in another location because as far as we can tell, an electron or a proton or a subatomic particle has exactly the same properties as every other particle of that type in the universe. Or maybe you take those original particles and you transport them to the destination and then you reassemble yourself according to that pattern. Is it you? If you talk to that person and you make them alive, right, they're going to tell you the exact same things you did. The exact same information that encoded you is going to encode them. And they will have your memories and experiences and all of that. But is it you? Or, in essence, as you say, did you just murder someone? Did you just murder a living human being and then say, oh, wow, and then I just recreated a new one out of nothing? That doesn't seem like something you you, you can really look forward to. In fact, in the, uh, in the prequel series Enterprise, Captain Archer famously faced that situation where there was the option to take a transporter, and he said he wouldn't put his dog through that thing. So so for me, a transporter might be physically possible, but I'd really encourage us to use it for non-living things rather than living beings. I'll take the shuttlecraft, thank you. Yeah. There are also several episodes that deal with the transporter accidents, and the, the, one, the, one that I, the ones that come to mind are the ones where copies are created. Uh, like there's the one of the in the original series where where there's a good Kirk and an evil Kirk, and then there's the one in the next generation where they create Will and Thomas Riker. Yeah, yeah, those are those are very iconic episodes, and I think they also really speak to that fear. And by the same thing, like why you know. We sort of do this on our computers a little bit, right? We have these different features. We can use cut and paste or we can use copy and paste. Yeah. And the whole thing is if you're using a transporter, boy, that sure seems like it's copy, paste, and delete the original. And that's yeah. – uh, boy, it's really hard to get comfortable with that notion, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And then there's – if you're going to do it with the um – with matter, you know, inert matter, why destroy the original? What would be the point? Yeah, I mean, that is a good point. Unless, of course, it's something where you, uh, you're getting rid of something that you don't want, you know, where where you're trying to uh, like clear out inventory or something, yeah. then then that might be a good reason to do it. But it could it could also be useful, you know, if you're talking about something like replicators, it seems like a transporter, like the recreating part of something yeah. is just the same technology that's in a replicator. And we have our own analogies to replicators that are very, very close at this point in time. All we need to do is start with the right material in the terms of like, say, a feedstock of some type, and we can replicate using 3D printing technologies, pretty much any shape, size, or structure that we want. As long as we have the right materials to create it out of, the right atoms, the right molecules, the right type of material, we can replicate pretty much anything we can dream up. We haven't, uh, we haven't done it for organic matter yet, except in the case of wood. We can 3D print wood at this point in time, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, another sticking point to a lot of diehard trekkers is the idea of impulse drive and i've looked into this personally myself uh, i've seen the calculations and based on the propellants exhaust velocity which uh, they use nuclear fusion i believe for the fuel for the impulse drive to get how much nuclear fusion fuel would be required to accelerate say the enterprise to half the speed of light it turns out to be 81 times its entire mass in hydrogen fuel, which translates to in excess of something like 300 million metric tons of fuel for a galaxy-class starship, which is just for a single acceleration and is to say nothing of bringing the ship to a stop at its destination. Is this a, a major implausibility as well? That's right. And so in cases like that, you, you have to sort of think to yourself like, okay... 
Star Trek, we have two ways to look at it. One is we can look at it and say, okay, this is what it said it did and how it said it did it. And that's what we're going to take a look at. And and I think if you restrict yourself to that, then you really close yourself off to the possibilities of what could actually happen. Because if you said, as you did correctly, hey, here are the calculations for what nuclear fusion can get you. And nuclear fusion is the most efficient fuel source based in matter that we know. But there's another fuel source that could be more efficient in principle and in practice as well, and that's if you used matter-antimatter annihilation. Mm -hmm. So if you said, well, hey, what if I didn't want to limit myself to using matter? What if I said nuclear fusion, yeah, that's great, but I know how inefficient it is. You know about Einstein's E equals MC squared. The way nuclear fusion works is you take light atomic nuclei, you fuse them together into heavier ones, and if you start with light enough elements, you will release energy. It's really weird we think about how the sun works. Most people don't realize, yes, it fuses hydrogen into helium, but if I were to take a helium atom and I were to put it on a scale and I were to take four hydrogen atoms, which, which make up a helium atom, and put them on the scale, I would discover that helium nuclear nucleus is about 0.7% lighter. It's about 0.7% lower in mass than the hydrogens that make it up. And that's because of binding energy. This energy gets converted, or sorry, this mass from hydrogen gets converted into energy via Einstein's E equals mc squared. So that 0.7% difference gets converted into energy. In our sun, over the four and a half billion year history of the sun, we've converted, the sun has converted about the mass of Saturn into pure energy. So if you were to say, well, what if you had on board the Enterprise a large amount of antimatter and a large amount of matter to annihilate with it? It turns out if you use the mass figures, you would only need about a quarter of your mass in fuel to be matter and antimatter for annihilating, and you would be able to accelerate up to about a quarter of the speed of light doing that annihilation. So the numbers will work out if you're willing to go to matter-antimatter annihilation instead of fusion rockets. So I did want to say, like, we... I think it's important to consider that, yes, Star Trek has some ideas for how things will work, and some of them are interesting, but some of them we can rule out, and where we can rule them out, let's not rule out the entire idea. And I think the great thing about Star Trek is that it revises itself, and it comes up with new ways on its own to do things differently and better. Uh, the example that comes immediately to mind is when they realized that well, the riders realized that they needed inertial dampers for its acceleration in order not to kill the passengers on board with uh, the G-forces. And you see a lot of really fascinating examples, especially in the original series of the riders coming up with concepts that were later used in mainstream physics. I think it was uh, the episode The Naked Time, where they travel backward in time three days, and the term Black Star was used and in that episode, if I'm not mistaken, and that was before John Archibald Wheeler coined the term black hole, which meant the same thing in it, uh, essentially in 1967. Yeah, it's really interesting because black holes as an idea had been around since the 18th century. You know, uh, the Reverend John Mitchell was the one who first formulated the idea that if you had a massive enough object in space, that its gravity would be so much that its escape velocity would be greater than the speed of light. And so an object would just appear completely dark. And, and Mitchell is maybe more famous for being the mentor and, and teacher of Henry Cavendish, who wound up being the first person to actually measure the mass of the Earth accurately, to weigh the Earth using gravitation. But this idea of black holes, like it's very common today, but you're absolutely right. It was not really being considered in the public consciousness in the 1960s and this Star Trek episode really brought it to really brought it to prominence where people were talking about it and thinking about it. And sometimes 
that's sort of the most interesting thing you can come up with. When we talked about warp drive, there's a big example there too. There is a space time now known as the Alcubierre spa space time because in 1994, a theoretical physicist named Miguel Alcubierre decided that he was going to try and engineer a space time where warp drive was possible. And that was what he discovered he could do is if you wanted your space time to have these particular properties where a spaceship can travel faster than light, you could do it. You would need this negative form of mass or negative form of energy. But if you had it, then what you could practically create was a space time where an object was traveling through it and the space in front of the object was being compressed and the space behind the object was being expanded. So as your object moves through this space, it moves through compressed space in front of you, meaning effectively you can reach your destination faster than a beam of light traveling through uncompressed space would reach it. Yeah, and that, that's pretty cool, and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the idea, but what strikes me as kind of interesting is that in Star Trek, that's not what warp drive is. You, you've already touched on this, that uh, Star Trek says here's how we did it, and okay, maybe that doesn't work, but there might be some other way to do it. But in Star Trek, they've always been on about that whole uh, warp drive is like messing with the subspace somehow. And I, I'm i a huge Trek nerd, but I've never actually looked into like the technical manuals or stuff like that. So do you have some kind of explanation to what is the, the in-universe explanation of warp drive. You know, I, I try not to get too much uh, caught up in that because, first off, there are a lot of in-universe things that evolve over time. Yeah. Um, you know, you if, if you are a big Trek fan, um, then you'll notice that when you talk, for example, about the transporter, there are many instances where they talk about the, the particle beam traveling from the source to the destination of the yeah. transport. And then there are other instances where there's very clearly no no material transfer that it's all just information that's coming yeah. over and you yeah, have to true. recreate that's this true. and so and so there are conflicting things i think in the original series what you mentioned earlier is is really the full extent of how they describe it but as you get into the next generation they start talking about warp bubbles and warp fields yeah. and and that you create this bubble around the starship in order to to travel at this and in fact i think there's an episode where Dr. Crusher gets caught in a warp bubble, in a static yeah. warp bubble that uh, that arises as part of one of, uh, I think, Wesley's science experiments. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you how big a nerd I am. The episode is Remember <laughs> Me. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, because yeah, uh, um, I think within Star Trek, and Martin, we both know this because it relates to an infamous episode, but the even the warp scales seem to change at random. Yeah. Because yeah. I think in TNG, they, they talked about warp 13, but then by the time Voyager comes around, you can't go faster than warp 10 or silly things happen to you. Yeah, I, I, I think I can answer that one, actually. Yeah. In early TNG, they say something about accelerate to faster than warp 10 and you'll travel backwards through time. So I think they were using the same warp scale that they do in Voyager. But when they mention warp 13, that's in an alternate timeline. Well, it's in the, so it's they, in the they future. Had pro yeah, they had probably changed the scale in that alternate universe. Holy crap, I'm a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is this is part of the fun stuff. This is part of what yeah. it's fun to speculate about. Yes. When, yes. When, when, you know, the prequel Enterprise comes out and they go at warp five, is that the same as when Kirk's Enterprise goes warp five or Picard's or Janeway's Voyager? I don't think that's yeah. sufficiently answered. But, no. but, you know, when you do talk about warp drive, one of the things I like to remember is that, you know, it is pretty, you can be pretty certain that at the very least, warp one means you just exceed the light barrier. Warp 10 
Except for when they have that, you know, the the finale of Next Generation. Warp 10 corresponds to infinite speeds, and we know that because Tom Paris had his famous Warp 10 flight <laughs> oh, yeah. in Voyager. Yeah. But, famous? But it was, <laughs> it was more like it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it was both of those, let's say. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that the speed at which the ships could travel moving forward in time always seemed to to go up in a reasonable fashion, right? Captain Archer's Enterprise could only go up to warp 5.2. For Kirk's, right, the original Enterprise, it could go to warp 8, and Scotty would always tell him that the engines won't do warp 9. The Enterprise D could go warp 9.8, but the Voyager could go 9.975, and they told us... They told us in the in the pilot of Voyager that it was going to take 75 years at that speed to travel the 70,000 light years they needed to, which which if you want to scale tells you that warp 9.975 means you're traveling at almost a thousand times the speed of light. <laughs> if you want to know what the warp scale means. How viable or plausible is the concept of finding and using wormholes in space-time to traverse huge distances in a relatively shorter time? Because I know one of the major barriers coming from the laws of physics is that infinitely curved regions of space-time are the only places where a wormhole would be possible, and those would be extremely unstable. Is there a... A mechanism in our modern understanding of physics today that can hold wormholes up and keep them open long enough? Well, that's that's the whole thing that, that I always found really uh, – this is something that I didn't put into the book because I, I am a fan, so I try not to talk about my pet peeves with some of the things. Oh. But, um, but one of my pet peeves with Deep Space Nine is that – in theory, this is what a wormhole is. A wormhole is a region of space that is so strongly gravitationally curved that if you enter it at one place, you can exit it at another place, that there's got to be something that holds this bridge open. And you can contrive solutions to that, but it always seemed to me just the most unreasonable thing that somehow the one place where you can go in the galaxy to find a stable wormhole is not near any supermassive sources and it also just takes you of all the places in the universe it takes you somewhere else in our own galaxy and i was like really deep space nine this is how you're gonna do that so I would say, like, yes, if you want to talk about travel through wormholes, which wasn't something that they were able to sort of create as a technology in Star Trek, but it was something they were able to take advantage of as naturally occurring and pass starships through it. Absolutely. The problem is any... Any hole in space that we know of can only be created by an incredible amount of mass. And as you get close to an incredible amount of mass, it's going to exert very strong tidal forces on you, which will threaten to stretch you in one direction and compress you in the other through a process that astrophysicists call spaghettification. So if you don't want to wind up like a strand of spaghetti, you're probably better off staying away from, you know, what some, what would I I say what some Ferengi prankster tells you like, oh, yeah, that's a wormhole. Just just go on in there, because I think it's a great way to get people to part with their ships. Yeah, because there was a an episode of was it Next Generation where they did have a wormhole, which they thought was stable. Wasn't it? I remember. But I think they found the entrance was, but the it was the exit of the wormhole was appearing in random places. If I recall, I can't remember the name of the episode, but you, do you know the one I mean? The one the one I remember that sounds closest to that. I might be thinking of the wrong episode where they uh, where they encountered the entity that sent them far across the universe that just sort of propelled them great distances away. No, that's not the one. But that's, that's that's, that's, that wasn't through a wormhole. No. That's there, 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 this was an early episode of Next Generation, and there was a bidding war for the rights to this wormhole, but yeah. then they found out that it wasn't, the exit was just very random. Never mind. The, yeah, the, the, the Ferengi uh, go through it and uh, get stranded in the Delta Quadrant, and then they meet them in Voyager later on. Yeah. Oh, uh, whatever. 
Yeah. I'm, yeah. You know, I, I, I was a big fan of the next generation, but I, I do have to confess that I didn't I didn't really think that it hit its stride until the third season. Like the oh, first season agree. had some good episodes and the second season had a lot more hits than the first one did for me. But but I think really in the third season was where I that's where I started. I think from the third through the seventh season, I've seen all of them multiple times, yeah. but yeah. but I haven't seen them all multiple times from the first two seasons. So in some cases, it's been a while. Yeah, uh, I'm do I'm the same. If I go on a on a TNG marathon, I just start with season three. I just ignore the first two because you yeah. can pretty much watch it without having to see them at all. I I usually pick the episodes that I actually don't hate. From the first couple of seasons, there are a few ones that I think are good. But well, I'm that still, that I was going to say to to you, Cal, if you um if you skip the first two seasons, you're going to miss some real gems. I I love. I can remember. I think it's called the Measure of a Man. Oh yeah. Where they, oh, yeah, put, where they put data on trial for his autonomy to see if he's human enough to to be granted the rights to determine what happens to him, if they can transfer him like a piece of equipment or whether he has the rights of an officer and they, they have a trial and it's, it's a wonderful exploration of what it means to be alive and whether we're androids gain that right. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, I watched that episode just with such, such wonderful, like, it's such a good question, right? Because when we think about an android, it's just very simply an android is an automaton that resembles a human being. And the androids we have in our world today, they do a fairly good job of resembling them. Although for my money, they, they still all fall in the uncanny valley. But wow, like if you have an android that has the brain of a human being or a superior brain to a human being, if they move like us, talk like us, and they feel, think, deceive, and love like us, like, who? even if it's an artificial creation, are we ready to say that these these entities don't have the same rights that, that living intelligent things do? There's one thing, probably one technology that, well, quite currently, which is close to Star Trek, is virtual reality, because it's, I hear a lot of people saying it's not getting too far away from holodecks. Uh, would you agree with that? I absolutely, I would agree with that. So I, I do take on the holodeck and holograms as a, as an entire chapter in this. One of the incredible advances that you make, of course, with virtual reality, with a VR headset, you can get this sort of uh, sight recreation where you where you where you get that visual sense of depth of three Dness, and it's it's very very good. And and of course, you can add audio very easily. But one thing that people haven't really talked much about that I think is phenomenal is they have made tactile feedback sensors where you can touch something and you can feel its physical presence like you can you can feel its shape they have a vr computer that they made where you can hold out your hand and try and catch what you think of as drops of falling water and they can actually make it so that you don't just feel the pressure when a drop hits you but you get that sensation of wetness which is absolutely incredible that they've engineered that. So these are these are technologies that I think you know if you can if you can tap into someone's external senses, right? If you can also get the sensations of of heat, of a scent, of a taste into your virtual reality experience, perhaps you'll even go a step further like you do, they do with uh, cortical implants or cybernetic implants yeah. in people and actually start giving them sensations of of fear or hunger or things that you might not experience except in real life. You know, at what point do you say this is successful? This is exactly like being in reality, except in a controlled sort of environment with a controlled experience. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Of course, I, I do worry about, you know, hollow diction where yeah. people are indulging their fantasies to the exclusion of their real world responsibilities, just like just like with anything. Yeah, because yeah. I think, uh, Marty, we've speculated on that, what it would do to the fertility rates of 
all of the X became real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, another we all one. know what everyone is going to be doing with, with this technology. That's what Quark rents out yeah. his Hollow Suites for. Well, that's why I say Space it's, Nine. <laughs> the Deep Space Nine is very realistic in that fashion, and that's what yeah. the holodex would be for, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, I think I think so as well. It is also uh, curious if you look back at it, how many uh, how many crew members have sort of lived out all sorts of love related fantasies on the holodeck. You know, Reg Barclay did it when he. Uh, when he seemed to have problems with self-confidence. Jordy mm. LaForge did it with Leia Brahms. Arguably, Will Riker and Minuet are an example of that, yeah. even though I know she came about through other means. But the holodeck is also incredibly useful for a number of real investigations beyond that. If you want to train an engineer on how to deal with a warp core breach, send them through a simulator. Don't put them in a breached warp core. If you want to see if a captain can has what it takes to send a crew member to their death yeah. for the good of the mission. If you want to simulate a starship battle or even do forensic investigations, right? Because when when Dr. Nell Apgar was murdered, it took using the holodeck to forensically investigate that to prove that events happened one way and not the other. But it's important that, you know, you remember what Star Trek really wanted. It didn't just want a visual projection of something, but a true matter hologram. We don't have like a matter hologram, but we do have ways of, of making lifelike, tangible you know, sensations that work in concert with, with this two-dimensional projection you can make. Uh, but then we have another thing uh, that happens with the holodeck that brings up a completely different thing, and that's Moriarty. Oh yeah, who, who become uh, who becomes self-aware. That, and that, that, that I've always thought was really interesting in terms of once you have a computer that can pass the Turing test, once you have a computer that's that knows how to create something that is indistinguishable from a human, right? You remember how Moriarty came about because the command to the computer was to create an opponent capable not of defeating Sherlock Holmes, but of defeating data. Yeah. And so if the computer, if the ship's computer is more intelligent than the ship's Android data, then okay, I believe the ship can do that. But if it can also pass the Turing test, what do you do when it makes a super intelligent, villainous antagonist that's artificially created? That's... I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it brings up the, a very interesting thing here because data is so intelligent and clearly passes a Turing test. Mm -hmm. So he is considered alive. Now, clearly the enterprise computer can create a being that is self-aware. So it would be pretty hard to argue that the enterprise computer couldn't also beat a Turing test and would therefore also be considered a person, right? So it I think that's fair. <laughs> I, I would accept that. <laughs> Because yeah, um, speaking about the holograms, because in each uh, version of Star Trek, they treat it very differently. Because then, I say in Deep Space Nine, you have Vic Fontaine, and he's self-aware, mm -hmm. but he just thinks, well, I'm a hologram, that's what I am. And then you've got the Doctor and Voyager, who kind of struggles with it almost. Yeah, and that's and that's I think a, a very great example is you know when you when you talk about the Doctor and Voyager, I sort of wonder every time like he seemed to enjoy being turned off in the beginning like why why am I even here I, this is useless for me but it is sort of a struggle because we we do attach a certain amount of like an ethical good to being alive if you're an intelligent being. Yeah. And so I don't know. I don't know entirely what to what to do about that. Yeah, because we are kind of at the stage where we are sort of interacting with technology to some degree, like we do in Star, like with um, Alexa or voice activate on Siri and all this. So you know that's not too far away. What they've got the idea, of, like being interactive technology. Yeah, and that's that's I think just wonderful because when we when we talk about those interactive technologies, when we talk about interacting with uh, something like a ship's computer, like that, that's really what I think of is like the advent of a of a natural language processor of something like that. 
I think with the ship's computer, it's combined two wonderful technologies envisioned by Star Trek. It's combined what I would say is a universal translator with the ship's computer, because what it does is it, you know, you talk to a device and you say, okay, like, okay, Google, what does the fox say? And Google will say, okay, I can take your words that I can understand and I can translate them into computer code and I can go process a query and then I can come back to you in your original language and tell you what the fox says. Okay, and that's actually a prank. Don't ask your Android phone what does the fox <laughs> say because you will it will prank you. But but that's that's I think a, a really wonderful thing that you know we we always look at universal translators as oh Oh, how do I go from uh, how do I go from French to English, or how do I go from Klingon to Romulan, or or something like that? But really, I think what a universal translator is impeccable at is going from human speech to a data-driven representation of what that means, and then converting it back into human-driven speech. So. The fact of the ship's computer that it can handle queries like that, that it can give you sensible answers and, and oftentimes in terms of what you want, although oftentimes not as well because as we're all aware, sometimes you have to clarify, sometimes you have to give it a different search, and sometimes, which happened in an episode with Reg Barclay, which I don't remember the episode title of, but perhaps Marty, you do. Um, <laughs> where he becomes super intelligent and he tells the ship to build him this thing so he can directly interface his brain to the ship's computer and the ship doesn't know how to do it, but Barkley just like, well, I'll tell you how to do it, and he does. Yeah, the end degree, and yeah. <laughs> uh, going back to yeah. this uh, matter-antimatter discussion, this uh, brings me to a topic that's pretty interesting to me in terms of how close we are to this technology, photon torpedoes and containing matter and antimatter with a barrier between them and then lifting the barrier to produce this. Well, maybe you can describe what's going on there. No, and that's that's actually brilliant. I, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite ones to research because I've been keeping up with the technology of this because it is it is of extreme interest to not only sci-fi fans but but there's been some significant physics developments along this front in the in recent years that that lend us to think that this will someday be possible, right? For antimatter containment, this is what powers a photon torpedo that you would have exactly as you say a large casing that has. Mass Matter on one side, antimatter on the other. They're contained, they're confined, and they're separated by a barrier. And at the critical moment when you want the torpedo to detonate, you remove the bat barrier, the matter and antimatter collide with each other and just annihilate, producing you know, an extreme outrush of photons in all directions, which, again, perfect example of E equals MC squared. The hardest part of this is creating and storing large amounts of stable antimatter, okay? The way we know how to create antimatter is basically we, our universe is full of matter. If you take two matter particles, let's say two protons with enough energy and you smash them together, you'll You'll get out the same particles you put in, you'll get two protons out. But if you put enough energy in, you will also get out particle antiparticle pairs. So maybe you'll get an extra electron and a positron, or maybe you'll get an extra proton and an antiproton. And so you do this, you create these large amounts of extra particles and antiparticles. And what can you do? You can then say, hey, I'm going to take these antiprotons and slow them down. And I'm going to take these positrons that I make the antimatter versions of electrons and slow them down. And can I get them to bind together to make a neutral anti-atom? Can I make my first anti-hydrogen atom? And you can, and we've done this. And then you say, okay, well, can I confine it? Can I make a trap? Because it's not allowed to touch matter. If it touches matter, it's going to annihilate. So you have to create a perfect vacuum and keep it isolated. As of 
I believe, so we created bound antiatoms for the first time in 1995. We created them by bombarding heavy elements with high energy anti-proton beams, which would give you electron-positron pairs, and a tiny fraction of your anti-protons would bind with the positrons, and then you get neutral antimatter. But the first time, 15 years after that, just seven years ago in 2010, they trapped anti-hydrogen. They not only made these anti-atoms, they made them cold at non-relativistic speeds, which meant that you could trap them in a combination of electric and magnetic fields. There's a special type of trap where you take a, an electric field that isn't uniform, that changes over time and through space, but has a uniform magnetic field in it. That makes uh, what we call a penning trap. So you use this to bring antiprotons and positrons together, and then you apply these non-uniform magnetic fields to bring them towards a magnetic minimum, right? Because hydrogen is made up of a positive and a negative part, so it has these intrinsic magnetic properties. By 2011, they had created antiatoms for up to 20 minutes at a time. Now, 20 minutes is a long ways away from keeping something stable for years, and a few atoms is a long way away from enough atoms to make a weapon, or a few anti-atoms is a long way from making a weapon. But in principle, we've made this. In principle, we've demonstrated that this is possible. So if you can make these antimatter, you know, stable devices that store antimatter, there's no reason you couldn't make a comparable one with matter, put it in a torpedo, launch it at your enemy ship, and kiss them goodbye. Yeah. But what I find interesting is that they call it a photon torpedo, though. And I mean, the reason for it, that is why because... Why not call it an antimatter torpedo? Well, the thing is, the antimatter is only as useful as the matter it annihilates with, right? Yeah. And so that's what happens. Whenever I take particles, antiparticles, this is where Einstein's E equals MC squared really shines because it's a 100% conversion of mass into energy. Antimatter has mass, matter has mass, but it's the collision of those two. That's what are the output products. Those are the end products is you collide a particle and an antiparticle and you get photons photons out. Yeah. So that's why they're photon torpedoes. What's amazing about that is if you're talking about having energy weapons like photons of any forms, whether they come from phasers or whether they come from photon torpedoes, what's your defense against them? Your defense is those uh, deflector shields, right? Yeah. It turns out that those deflector shields can actually physically be made also deflector shields as far as we know are reals what we do is we we create something that's called a plasma mirror right what we do is we we'll make a plasma shield around something where you have you know ionized particles and when you have photons coming in even like you know laser light pulses or anything from phasers or photon torpedoes or whatever these photons if you have a plasma mirror there, they can, if they're oriented properly, just reflect the light away so it will never hit what's behind that plasma shield or plasma mirror. The only cost is that electrons get scattered out of a plasma. This is a brand new technology, though, that you can protect yourself against photons simply by having an ionized plasma, and the electrons will take that energy instead, and they'll get kicked out. So if you have a thick enough plasma mirror, you can shield yourself from any types of photons. This was only successfully demonstrated for the first time two years ago in 2015. So this is a brand new technology that's that's just starting to come to fruition. Well, wouldn't that mean that basically you create this, if you, if you make this mirror like it, it, it's around a ship, wouldn't that also mean that light bounces off it or just so you're you're exactly right to hit on that's the that's the unfortunate side effect is yeah. if you make a plasma shield then you're not so good at seeing out anymore right right if you're preventing photons from getting in then those same effects are going to prevent photons from getting out so that is that is the drawback that just as star trek envisioned many of your other systems would be unable to function properly with the shields up 
right? And and we know that Star Trek sort of alluded to this, that they sort of said, well, okay, one of the things you can't do is if you have a cloaking device, you can't fire if your ship is cloaked. So I would just say, yeah, that's that's just a detail where they got the limitation on the wrong technology because yeah. cloaking devices can be real and there's nothing to prohibit you from firing when you are cloaked but to fire photons like photon torpedoes or a phaser while you have your shields up that that would be uh the shield itself would would block you from that you would also have the inability to use tractor beams or to see or communicate past your shield so scanners and visual displays would be knocked off lines too I think, though, that the reason why you can't fire or raise shields when cloaked is... The explanation has to do with the power consumption, I think. The cloaking device requires so much power that there's just no practical way to do it. And then, of course, there are examples where they have ships that can fire while cloaked. Right, and I'm I'm never going to, you know, tell you that, like, oh, you should you should make sure that that you've got all your science exactly right or you can't tell the story you want to tell. I don't think that that restrictive nature is is very helpful, but I I think it's important to realize like if you want to use physics to circumvent these limits that you you have to be honest with yourself about about what actually is it going to take in order to accomplish this and what will you lose if you if you do accomplish this the ways we've conceived of and i think that that you know obviously you can't fault star trek for getting this wrong 50 years ago or 30 years ago many of the things we're doing now that we're, we're physically actually doing and bringing to fruition now seem just as futuristic as warp drive or transporters or sub space communication or traveling through a stable wormhole uh, seem today that many of these things are real and many of these things are about to become real. And so it's it's really up to us to sort of be honest about that and be excited about that because, you know, our imaginations are bigger than our current technology will ever be. One example of uh, what you just mentioned, things that are real or about to become real today that were pretty exotic when Star Trek first came out. I'm thinking about medical technologies like tricorders and hyposprays. Well, it's really interesting for hyposprays because hyposprays have actually been around for a very, very long time. In the United States, we had a big problem in the 70s where there was a strain of flu that really threatened to become an epidemic. And for that, we decided we needed an incredibly rapid mass vaccination campaign. And so, you know, we needed something that could deliver shot after shot after shot after shot really, really quickly. And so they developed in order to to help vaccinate people very rapidly. In the late 50s, they invented what was called the jet injector which is something that was used as a, it's honestly, it was one of the only technologies that seemed unique and innovative in Star Trek that existed before Star Trek. It's just a high pressure system of air or gas that allows a liquid dose to be administered in a stream through the skin and into the patient. You know, if you get, you know, shot by a high powered grease gun and go to the hospital, you might, uh, you might call that an accidental jet injection, but a, a person purposeful jet injection has been around for tremendous medical professionals. Small, you know, it set the world immunization record in 1976. 50 million Americans were vaccinated against the swine flu in 10 weeks. But the problem with it is it's fallen out of favor because there's this unavoidable problem. It breaks the patient's skin and breaking the patient's skin results in a risk of getting blood on the device. That was something that Star Trek never addressed. And so the whole goal of vaccine is not just to protect you against what you're vaccinating you against, but also to prevent you from being contaminated. So if you added a single use protector cap, that didn't solve the contamination problem because something like hepatitis V could permeate that. So fear of needles is real, though. The, we, we are working on not just single-use jet injectors where, where people can have their own devices for like administering insulin or something, but 
They made, in 2012, the MIT Bioinstrumentation Lab. They developed a new hypospray-like device that's completely programmable in terms of pressure. So you can not only deliver large protein-based injections, but it can be tailored to penetrate anything from like scar tissue on an adult to like the softest areas of a baby's skin. So it injects material where through something where the cross-section is as small as a mosquito's uh, proboscis. So the whole goal of this is if you can, if you can keep, if you can solve that, I guess, what is it? If you can solve that blood or contamination risk, if you can solve that problem, then hyposprays absolutely have the opportunity to not only become real, but to replace needles entirely. And the, the other one you mentioned about a tricorder, absolutely. You know, they, the Qualcomm just had their Tricorder X Prize, where they challenged teams to create a real-life tricorder that could successfully diagnose over a dozen different medical conditions in a single handheld device that weighs less than five pounds. And not only have they done so, but Final Frontier Medical Devices came up with a prototype called Dexter DX. T-E-R that won the two and a half million dollars that will fund clinical trials. So this is this is something that's really exciting because not only can a tricorder do all these things of detecting and diagnosing diseases, continually, continuously monitoring health metrics, monitoring your overall health in short and long terms, and summarizing someone's state of health or illness and tell you whether you're fighting something off, this not only is coming into existence, but pretty much all technology experts are predicting that this is going to be in widespread use by the end of the 2020s. The smart bet, honestly, is that such a device will wind up even being smaller and more compact than the original Star Trek tricorder. Yeah, because you think about it when you remember the original Star Trek and the thing they had at the end of the, the beds for the meters showing all their vital signs, and now you've got smartwatches which can give you all that information right on your wrist. Oh, absolutely. And if you think about Lieutenant Uhura's uh, giant in-earpiece communicator, like, you know, we have we have Bluetooth devices today that can do more things than her device ever did that are even smaller than that. Yeah. So in some ways, we've kind of overtaken Star Trek. Absolutely. I think I think the biggest ways that we've overtaken Star Trek are very clear when it comes to computing needs. You'll remember when Next Generation came out, it was a big deal that they had isolinear chips. And right now, an isolinear chip looks so antiquated when you compare it to, say, a flash drive. Like our... Yeah. Our little flash drives are more powerful than than something that was envisioned to be the ultimate in computing power just 30 years ago. As long as they don't try going down the route of gel packs. Of all the technologies in Star Trek, which are the ones that you're most excited about finally coming to fruition? What do you think would be like just the greatest boon to humanity if we can do it? Warp drive, I think definitely. Without even think warp drive would be, would open up so much that... I have to agree with that, especially in light of uh, all the plans and development that's going into Mars missions. It's really hard to argue with that. I think warp drive is, you know, it's what puts the star in Star Trek. Without yeah. it, we're we're not we're not going anywhere. But I I'm a little surprised that no one's brought up Synthahall yet. I sort uh, of think that <laughs> I was about to bring up Synthahall. <laughs> that's, that's that's maybe of a... one of my one of my favorites. I I especially like when they recover Scotty in the episode yeah. Relics and they uh and he just decries this terrible, terrible stuff in this world full of, uh, what does he call it, synthetic alcohol and synthetic commanders, because he, yeah. he can't get over data, and he can't get over, uh, yeah, he, he has a very hard time with this. But one of the things I, I love about this is we're actually discovering entire classes of drugs that can hit the right GABA receptors in your in your body and in your brain to give you like to discern which types of feelings you want that we normally associate with drunkenness to, to be with you, that it can give you the 
in theory, it can give you the, what do I call it, the positive feelings where you have the improved confidence and the enhanced wisdom and that warm feeling and the and the the perceived invulnerability, but they also have downsides, right? You have that mental impairment, you have the dehydration, you have the nausea, you have the hangover. And so what Gene Roddenberry, because this is actually one of the ones that Gene Roddenberry himself dreamed up and credited to the Ferengi for the invention, is he said, you want to imagine that one moment you're laughing with your friends, carrying on in your tipsy state, and then the red alert alarm goes off. What do you do? Well, Roddenberry envisioned that this rush of adrenaline would flow through your bloodstream and the tipsiness would disappear and you're back to a stone cold sober state. Now, in reality, adrenaline is not going to do that for you. But if you want no hangover, no upset stomach, no loss of equilibrium, no dizziness and no blurred vision, all you'd need to do is say, well, I've got this material in my body that's binding to these receptors. So either what I can do is I can put in an inhibitor that will prevent these receptors from being trigger triggered, or I can just develop a drink that that will give you that will bind to the certain subtypes of receptors that will that will give you the good feelings, but that won't bind to anything that'll give you the negative feelings. Yeah. There's an entire class of chemicals that give you those feelings. It's not just alcohol. The class of chemicals is called benzodiazepines. And these are drugs that you've heard of like Valium, Xanax, and Clonopin. The neurochemistry of these drugs all enhance GABA, which is a neurotransmitter transmitter that depresses the central nervous system. So yeah, it has a sedative effect. It gives you that relaxed feeling. It also has those undesired effects. But rather than molecules that just are full GABA receptor agonists, which means that they enhance the, effect, the effects of, of this uh, chemical across the board, they, it's possible to develop a chemical that only hits some of the receptors. GABA is a complicated acid. It's gamma aminobutyric acid. But the chemicals, like the binding sites that it has, there are all sorts of different receptors that some molecules that have GABA like will bind to these subunit receptors but they won't bind to these other ones. So if you can find ones that bind to the ones you want them bound to, but don't bind to the ones you don't want them bound to, that should work out great. The one leading candidate is called Bretazinil, which was invented in 1988 and is a member of that family that acts like a partial agonist. It's less resistance to drug tolerance. It has fewer withdrawal. It's, it has fewer withdrawal symptoms, and most compellingly, it only binds to specific subunit receptors that the other ones don't. It has negative effects too, so it's probably not the right one, but it's conceivable at any moment that a real-life version of Synthahol may just be one drug trial away. It was a real good time to research this. Yeah, because there was, uh, remember, an episode of Deep Space Nine where they go undercover into the, I think it's the main chamber of the Klingons where there's a big party going on and they're given a drug to prevent them getting drunk on the blood wine. Yeah, there's that. And, of course, there is also the other one you described, the Synthahol. So both were explored in a way in Star Trek. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that'd be very powerful. You know, the only... Uh, the only way I know of to make sure you don't get drunk when you drink alcohol is to boil it first. But that's uh, good luck. Good luck sneaking that one under the radar or past the Klingons. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. too bad our uh, other co-host Kitch isn't here. He's our resident biotechnologist, and uh, he would be fascinated and overjoyed to hear about Synthahol. Well, um, he'll just have to listen to the podcast then. <laughs> yeah. And he's Irish as well. <laughs> And you've got a Scotsman here. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, uh, one, I myself am one, not Scottish, but I you can catch me in a kilt every day if you see me in real life. All right, cool. There was one thing, I don't know if you cover this in the book, and it's in that Scotty episode and it's the whole Dyson Sphere thing. So you know, you can you can ask about. It. I didn't I didn't touch on this in the book because that's uh, it does only appear in one episode. But a Dyson sphere is sort of a, an idea that's run through science fiction ever since Freeman Dyson first proposed it. So if you have a question about it, you know, please go ahead. Yeah, 
Yeah, so is the Dyson sphere in that episode, does it resemble what Freeman Dyson was postulating? You know, when you talk about building a Dyson sphere, the whole idea is that, look, uh, a star of any type is going to emit a whole lot of energy. And if you're on a planet a certain distance away from it, you're only capturing a very, very tiny amount of it. And yet, if you could capture more of it or all of it, wow, you could you could accomplish so much. For example, if you were to take all of the sunlight incident on Earth and say, I want to take this and I want to turn it into useful energy. Oh, we would we would be able to do so much. We would be able to do maybe maybe 10,000, 20,000 times what we're able to do on Earth today in terms of having usable energy. But that's not enough to do everything that we want to do. For example, over time, the sun is going to heat up just because it's burning nuclear fuel in its core and that means that means by its very nature it's going to expand it's going to increase its luminosity and in about 1 to 2 billion years that's going to be hot enough that it'll boil the oceans at earth's surface and that that's pretty bad for life so you might say well one possible solution is to migrate planet earth outwards and if you wanted to do that, you would need more energy than you can get, even if you put solar panels on every square inch of Earth. So what are your other possible solutions? Well, one is to build a big spherical structure that captures all of the star's energy. You would need a tremendous amount of matter to do that, but that's really the only restriction. If you built this device, exterior to the planet you were interested in, this is fantastic. Now, you would need some way of dissipating that heat because, you know, energy in, you have to have that energy balance or you're just going to heat up and boil your boil your Dyson sphere. But in theory, in theory, a, Di a Dyson sphere, so long as you have enough material and you you have it radiate heat away back into the external universe properly, there's no reason you can't convert that solar energy into usable electrical energy for whatever purposes you want. I think it's a, a really novel concept. Of course, from my own perspective, I'm not sure that a Dyson sphere is the best way to do this. I would I would be a much bigger fan of, say, wouldn't it be smarter to go closer to the sun and get your energy from there and then beam it back to you somehow or transport it to you somehow in a usable fashion? Yeah, because I've heard that's one of the objections to a Dyson sphere of if a society could actually build that, they said you would use the technology in a far more efficient way than that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's your hope, too, is that one of the things that I think when you talk about these future technologies and optimizing them, you want to make it as efficient as possible. So if you're looking at, you know, encapsulating, like encircling an entire star, of course, you, you could do that. But why would you choose to? Unless there was some reason where, where you needed to, where there was some fatal flaw with getting too close to an energy source. And and there there may be, but we we have materials that can withstand a lot of heat. And so it seems sort of a little silly. It seems sort of a little silly to to build something that large and extravagant when something smaller and less extravagant would arguably be just as effective. Yeah, just overkill basically. Yeah, and then, then there's also the issue of um, uh, what Dyson had in mind as far as, as, far as I understand, he wasn't suggesting uh, building a solid uh, yeah, sphere. Was... Uh, that's something called a Dyson shell, if I recall correctly. Yeah. That's what's shown in Star Trek, where people are living on the inside of this, and it's like... I don't know how many gazillion planets worth of space, but Dyson Sphere is more like a network of satellites. Yeah, it's a chain, as, kind of, as far as I understand it. Yeah, you might be you might be more accurate if you called it a Dyson Swarm yeah, rather than a Dyson right. Sphere. Yeah, but I, I think the the, the sphere uh, what Dyson meant with a Dyson Sphere is simply something that is all around the star. He wasn't thinking of the, of the basically encasing the star in a, in, a, in a shell, but rather just there are things in every direction. 
Yeah, I think that's a smarter plan as well. The Star Trek incarnation of that Dyson sphere, where they did have that large spherical shell outside of it, I think that's uh, that's sort of an interesting concept. And it's where we get uh, – it's one of the places we get our modern idea of what would an alien megastructure look like, of what would a, a sufficiently advanced civilization that wanted to harness all of the energy from its star, what what would it do? And I think the idea of building a large spherical shell around the star is, you know, it might not be the only solution, but it would certainly be a surefire way to capture 100% of that energy. Oh, yeah. Uh, of course, it, it does raise the issue of, uh, of where would they get the material? How many solar systems worth of uh, material would be used? All I can say to that is there are a whole lot of uninhabited planets out there. And and if you want something that's rich in heavy elements, your best bet is to go to the innermost worlds in the solar system. So Mercury, for example, is of all the planets in the solar system, it's the one that's made out of the heaviest elements. So if we had enough time and wanted to disassemble Mercury bit by bit, piece by piece, and build it into a shell, like there, the raw materials are there. Well, uh, this has been the uh, a fascinating discussion, and it's been by far the geekiest episode we've ever done. We're going to wrap up right about now. Ethan, where can people find you and your work? And also, do you have any parting words, like the biggest selling point of your upcoming book that you want to share? You know, I think if you're someone who's curious about the future, about where we are today and how we're going to better our lives, you've got to remember this is this is something that starts by having these fanciful, fanciful dreams, right? We can envision what a technological utopia would look like, and not that technology is going to be our salvation, but that the combination of technology with our humanity is going to be what makes humanity advance to the next stage in our existence. Part of what makes us human is the journey to continuously strive for that next frontier, to cross the next boundary, to explore the newest unknowns, and to unlock the next set of possibilities. That That's a journey that doesn't end with us, but continues from generation to generation, with each one enjoying a better quality of life than the last. We haven't reached our limits yet, and our mission, the one we think of for humanity, to boldly go where no one has gone before continues, and it's up to us to make us so. So if you'd like to pre-order a copy of Treknology, it's available for pre-order on Amazon today, and it'll be out in mid-October if you're interested in it. And if you want to see more of my writing, my first book, Beyond the Galaxy, is already out, and I keep an almost daily uh, website called Starts With a Bang, which is on Forbes.com today. Great. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the show. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Thank you for listening to Trolling with Logic. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. If you love the show, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Supporting us at $5 or more per episode will get you access to exclusive, patron-only bonus content, early access to shows before everyone else, and other incentives. We are an amateur production, but with your patronage, we can help improve our audio quality and cover the costs for doing the show. We are grateful for anything you can pledge to the show. Go to www.patreon.com slash trollingwithlogic to sign up if you are so inclined. We want to thank our three patrons who currently have chosen to support us. These patrons are Microbloganism, Josh at the Society for the Advancement of Science, and Avinash Kumar. Thank you very much for your support, which is helping us out. Thanks to you three, we have now been able to hire a professional audio editor, so now you can all look forward to higher quality audio. If you have any suggestions for topics or guests you would like to hear on this show, let us know on Twitter or on our Facebook page. Thanks again for listening.
you know, are the ones that that maybe the laws of physics just don't allow them. So, for example, subspace communication might be able to be ruled out because there's no such thing as subspace. So it's pretty hard to have subspace communication if there isn't any such thing as subspace. But that doesn't mean that you can't, through some other method, accomplish the same thing. So would it be possible to communicate faster than light across a great distance? And that may be possible if warp drive is possible. So with warp drive, like if general relativity and the standard model of particles and physics as we know it is all there is, then yes, warp drive would be impossible. But there are many extensions to the universe as we envision it that could be perfectly consistent with general relativity and enable warp drive. So for example, if you can create a form of negative mass in the universe or a form of negative energy, then all of a sudden warp drive goes from just a theoretical construct to something that is possible. So in cases like that, we've decided to look at what would it take in order for this to be true. So I'd say the three that are the, are the hardest sell because they would require something new are subspace communications, warp drive, and a transporter. A transporter, yeah. I think, is a really hard one as well. Yeah, the transporters is the one that comes to mind to me to be uh, pretty ridiculous. Actually, that there there are uh, it's not just the problem of how to do it; it's also what is it exactly that that you are doing. I mean, if you break someone down into molecules, obviously that person dies, and then you create a copy. That's a really good point because I think one of the things that Star Trek was always phenomenal at is it never shied away from the big ethical questions. Right. It never shied away from saying, well, even if you could do this technologically, should you? And I think with a transporter, there is a real danger there. Imagine that you to the original Star Trek than it did to the present day. Star Trek The Next Generation is 30 years old, and yet just in between those two shows, they had to thoroughly revise how they conceived of the future because those 21 years of advances were, were so tremendous that many of the things that Star Trek just said, oh, like this will be really futuristic. Imagine a door someday that, that knows when you're coming and can self-open and just slide apart. You have those every time you walk into a supermarket or an airport now. These are these are commonplace things. So, you know, flip phone communicators were were sort of, you know, just so futuristic when the original Star Trek envisioned them. And the idea that you could have an interactive computer or a touchscreen computer was incredibly futuristic in 1966. And yet by time 1987 came around, by time Star Trek The Next Generation was on the air, some of those technologies had already come to fruition. So when it came time to write and research this book to say what what about this idea is so great i said let's pick the most just the most ubiquitous technologies that people associate with star trek just the ones that pop into your mind immediately things like phasers and tricorders and photon torpedoes and warp drive and antimatter containment and a hypospray and and so many others like subspace communication or or the old style communicators all of those just sprang to mind and we wound up with 28 different technologies that we said this is going to be what we're focus on focusing on and we're going to examine each one in depth and see where are we now what's the science behind them are they feasible and if not what would it take to make them feasible and how close are we to having these be a reality and that's how the book came about so just to kind of preempt it, have any of the technologies you've looked at just you've been able to completely rule out as being total pie in the sky? You know, I would say when that's a really good question. I would say the three that are closest to being ruled out are, I think it's important to realize, like, if you want to use physics to circumvent these limits, that you, you have to be honest with yourself about, about what actually is it going to take in order to accomplish this and what will you lose if you if you do accomplish this the ways we've conceived of. And I think that that, you know, obviously you can't fault Star Trek for getting this wrong 50 years ago or 30 years ago. Many of the things we're doing now 
that we're, we're physically actually doing and bringing to fruition now seem just as futuristic as warp drive or transporters or subspace communication or traveling through a stable wormhole uh, seem today. Welcome to another episode of Trolling with Logic, the podcast where we bring the hammer down on ignorance, unreason, and superstition on a bi-weekly basis. I'm your host, Nathan Dickey, and joining me as usual is Cal. All right, it's great to be here. And Marty is back with us for one of his rare yeah. appearances. Yeah, hi. I hope I can make more appearances nowadays. Yeah, we hope so too. Joining us as our special guest on today's episode is Dr. Ethan Siegel, a theoretical astrophysicist, cosmologist, and science writer. Dr. Siegel received his PhD at the University of Florida, where his graduate work focused on the study of cosmological perturbations and their effects on the universe. He currently engages in science outreach and communication and hosts and writes the podcast and Forbes column starts with a bang. He's the author of the 2015 book Beyond the Galaxy, how humanity looked beyond our Milky Way and discovered the entire universe. Ethan is also the author of a new book to be released later this year in the fall called Treknology, the Science of Star Trek from Tricorders to Warp Drive, which is the subject of this episode as we are discussing the science and technology of Star Trek and the increasingly blurry line between science fiction and science reality. Welcome to the show, Ethan Siegel. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Nathan. It's my pleasure to be here. The pleasure is all ours. There's a famous saying we've all heard, which is life imitates art. And this has been especially true in the case of early sci-fi from like the 19th century with commonplace technologies today, such as the submarine being forecasted by writers like Jules Verne, for example. Your upcoming book explores what most perceive to be the more exotic technological marvels of Star Trek and examines how close, far away, or even possible some of these as yet fictional technologies are to us today. Tell us a little about the process of researching and writing this book. You know, for me, you, you know, when you think of Star Trek, you think of this futuristic utopia set in space where there are conflicts, but also where technology has been used to vastly improve improve our lives, where our qualities of life have, have gone up tremendously, where issues like poverty and starvation are, are really non-issues anymore, and where most medical ailments can be cured with just a few futuristic scans and hyposprays. And we sort of look at this as, oh, like, how is any of this possible? Like, this is, this is a pipe dream, except it isn't a pipe dream. All of this is rooted in scientific possibility. When Star Trek first premiered 51 years ago now, almost everything that it envisioned was was just so far seeming in the future that we didn't think we'd have any of it, that many people didn't, and that's why they sent it. They set it hundreds and hundreds of years in the future. By time Star Trek The Next Generation came out, though, in 1987, so this is also a really long time ago, most of us don't really realize that Star Trek The Next Generation came out closer, can know everything there is to know about you and your mind and your body, that you can scan in the position and momentum of every single particle in your body and how they bind together. And then what you do is you take all of that information and you deconstruct your body molecule by molecule, atom by atom, particle by particle, and you rematerialize your body someplace else. Okay, so maybe maybe you use identical particles in another location because as far as we can tell, an electron or a proton or a subatomic particle has exactly the same properties as every other particle of that type in the universe. Or maybe you take those original particles and you transport them to the destination, and then you reassemble yourself according to that pattern. 
is it you? If you talk to that person and you make them alive, right, they're going to tell you the exact same things you did. The exact same information that encoded you is going to encode them. And they will have your memories and experiences and all of that. But is it you? Or, in essence, as you say, did you just murder someone? Did you just murder a living human being and then say, oh, wow, and then I just recreated a new one out of nothing? That doesn't seem like something you you, you can really look forward to. In fact, in the, uh, in the prequel series Enterprise, Captain Archer famously faced that situation where there was the option to take a transporter, and he said he wouldn't put his dog through that thing. So for me, a transporter might be physically possible, but I'd really encourage us to use it for non-living things rather than living beings. I'll take the shuttlecraft, thank you. Yeah, there are also several episodes that deal with the transporter accidents, and the the one the one that I, the ones that come to mind are the ones where copies are created. Uh, like there's the one of the in the original series where where there's a good Kirk and an evil Kirk, and then there's the one in the next generation where they create Will and Thomas Riker. Yeah, yeah, those are 